give you praise. The people of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to your name. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to pray in the spirit. Even as the word of God is coming, prepare your heart to receive the word. Mende bere de koshi de brehe de kaparabalas. Ire de ke brada kalia tata brada kadia laba. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Oh, ya laba ha satele mekita laba ha. Brede kamba di brata la katush tatele kadia. La kun de pele de stelaharas. Oh, yes, Lord. For unto you shall the garden of the people be. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We give you praise for today. As your word is coming, we pray that, Lord, you open the eyes of our understanding. Let your word find a place in our hearts and let your word bear fruit in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for today. Today is 25th February 2024 and uh, we thank God. Today I'll be talking on the trend setting systems of the cosmos. The trend setting systems of the cosmos. I hope we all know how we got here. Um, we are in the, the general series on uh, the ministry system of the believer and then we got to crucial foundations that must be laid for ministry in every believer. Then we saw that there were four major foundations having three strands each, making up 12 foundations for every believer, you know, in preparation for fruitfulness or ministry. And we saw the foundation of knowledge, uh, I mean, uh, three major foundations, sorry, foundation of knowledge, and foundation of character and foundation of leadership. And we go to the foundation of knowledge and then we, 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 we saw three strands, the foundation of the knowledge of the word of God, uh, then the knowledge of God, then the knowledge of self. And now we are still on that foundation of knowledge, the last strand, which is the knowledge of the cosmos. And under the cosmos, we've with um, take a bit of a journey just under the cosmos. Uh, we saw that there were systems of the cosmos. We have to know the cosmos thoroughly because we are going to be dealing with the world. The world is our major assignment and therefore we need to understand its operations and, and its systems. And we realize that there are six systems of the cosmos. Uh, the immunity hacking system of the cosmos, the mind bending system of the cosmos, the occultic system, the religious system, the trend-setting system, and the tribulation system. And we've gone through all these systems, and today we have come to the trend-setting system of the cosmos. In other words, there's a system or department of the cosmos that is responsible for setting trends, setting standards, setting the standard, setting the trends. Uh, in other words, influencing society. Uh, detecting the pace at which life should go. There's a part of the cosmos that is responsible for that. Shaping culture or influencing culture. In fact, the, 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 the department in the, uh, in, the, in the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness that oversees this structure is the rulers of the darkness of this world. Because this system seeks to perpetuate darkness in the hearts of people. And so that people can set standards having their hearts darkened. When your heart is darkened, the standard you set will be a standard that is a function of the darkness in your heart. And so therefore, people who bend toward your standard will have to bow to the darkness that is also in your heart. And so that is the ultimate desire of the kingdom of darkness. That is to lead the church lead the church especially when it comes to the church their main idea is to lead the church so as to dilute our influence uh, so as to corrupt corrupt the church 
Because if, if the world is leading the church, it is certainly going to lead the church in the wrong direction. But then, um, God also has an antidote to it. But today, I'm talking about the problem. Then next week, God willing, I'll talk about the antidote that God has, God has provided in his people. So, this influence, um, influence started in the Garden of Eden. That was, that was one of the desires of God, that his influence would spread all over the world. Adam was not supposed to just tend the garden. He was supposed to replicate Eden all over the world because only Eden had the presence of God. All over the world, the only spot that contained God's presence was the garden that God planted in the eastern part of Eden. So not even, even all of Eden didn't have God's presence. It's just the eastern part, just the garden. And, and God wanted Adam to know that I've put you here so that you can extend my presence. You can, you can extend my presence to cover the entire world. And God gave man a picture. And the picture God gave man about this influence is in Genesis 2 verse 10 to 14. It was about a river. He said, now a river went out of Eden, that's the place called Eden, to water the garden. And from there it parted into, it parted and became four river heads. The river went out from where? Eden. And watered the garden. Then from the garden, it parted into four river heads. Uh, which went around the whole world. The name of the first is Pishon. Is the, land, is the one which scares the whole land of Havila where there is good. The name of the second, and the good of the land is good. Delium and the only stone are there. Okay. The name of the second river is Gihon. Is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedeko. Is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. So these are four major river heads, you know, that give birth to all the streams, lakes, seas, rivers we have in this world. And they, they came from Eden. And so God was telling Adam that the same way something started in Eden and went around the whole world, it, what my mind is that Eden um, should be the, the base from where the, my knowledge, knowledge of God, and the knowledge of my glory will permeate and pervade the whole earth. That was, that was what God wanted to do. Because um, um, uh, uh, God has made a decree to himself that the, the earth will be covered by the knowledge of God and by the knowledge of his glory. And that decree will come to pass. That prophecy that God gave to himself will come to pass. And that, was, that has been God's desire. Yeah, come to Isaiah 11 verse 9. Isaiah 11 verse 9. And the Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see that he's comparing the knowledge of the, of the Lord to waters. Waters. Okay, so the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The same river that was in the garden that was supposed to cover the whole earth. So then the second one is Habakkuk 2.14, which says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So two things here. Are, are you seeing? Are you following? The knowledge of God, number one, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, number two. These are the two things God has said will cover the earth. Will cover the earth. And God has made something, he has done something in the church that will, that will help us, you know, to, to carry that thing out. This, 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 this Isaiah 11 verse 9 was talking about the thousand year reign of Christ. When Christ comes finally to reign for a thousand years, he's going to show us what man was supposed to do, how man was supposed to rule over the earth. And so in Christ's kingdom, there's going to be the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the glory of God. There's going to be peace, perfect peace. There's going to be righteousness. There's going to be prosperity in Christ's kingdom. That's what Adam failed to achieve, you know, 
And uh, like I said at that time, I said that man will finally get to live a full day, a full thousand year period, where all that God intended for man will be seen in that thousand year period. Bible says one day is as thousand years, and thousand years as one day. But Adam didn't live a full day because God said, the day you eat the tree, in that day you shall surely die. So the kingdom era, which is going to be the next era after this era, is going to be full of the perfect will of God. And these two things, knowledge of God and the knowledge of the glory of God, they are going to cover the whole earth. As the waters cover the sea, they are going to cover the whole earth. Now, it's going to happen. And in that era, the earth will be described as a place where righteousness dwells. You know, um, in, in 2 Peter 3 verse 13, it says, We seek for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see, nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth, in which righteousness dwells. So that era is going to be an era where righteousness will be the mainstay. It will be the mainstay of God's economy, of, 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 of the administration of Jesus over the thousand year period. Uh, Hebrews 13, 14 says, we don't have any city on this earth that continues. He says, for here we have no continuing city. We have no eternal everlasting city, but we see the one to come. The one to come will come after this age, which is the kingdom age, where this earth will be turned into paradise. And we'll be here. We'll be here to reign with Jesus for a period of thousand years. But we see we shall reign with the, with the Lord on the earth. Now, but then, till that time comes, we'll have to live with darkness in this, in this, in, on this earth. Because darkness was voted into government by Adam. Uh, I mean, darkness was dead before Adam, but it was voted into power by Adam. What I mean is that the devil was dead before Adam, but it was Adam who activated the reign of the devil. So the rulers of the darkness of this age, they were given their power by the choice Adam made in the Garden of Eden. And from that time, uh, many people in, on this earth have been under the sway of the prince of the power of the, of, the, of the air. Now, darkness, go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. And let me show you something. The light and darkness. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Mm -hmm. Okay, go to verse 4. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, what happened was that when um, Lucifer's territory was destroyed, you know, by water, I, I, can't, I can't go into that. That's, that's what uh, led to the state that we see in verse 2. The earth was without form, uh, void, and darkness upon the face of the deep. That was the result of God's judgment on Lucifer's territory. Okay. Now, when God came on the scene, he said, let there be light. That phrase, let there be light, simply means, I am. That's what it means. So, when God saw the problem, God just came and said, Hoya. That phrase, Hoya, it means, I am. I've come. I established myself as a source. As a source, as the beginning. Now I'm going to work. So when he says I am, what came out was light. Okay, so God established himself as a source of life. And light came out of that source. We can see that in John 1, verse 1 to 4. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. And nothing was made without him. In him was life. In who? In him was life. In the word. In him was life. And the life was a light. So what God did was that God established himself as the number one life. In him, the source of life. Then light came out of him. And so light 
comes out of life. Light comes out of life. Yes. So that, 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 is, that is God's formula. Light always comes out of life. Out of life. In him was life, and that life became the light of, 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 of man, of men. Okay. Now, that's why God wanted them to eat the tree of life before even having access to the tree of knowledge. God never wanted knowledge to come before life. It is life that must produce light, knowledge. Anytime you see knowledge without life, that knowledge will lead to darkness. That light will lead to darkness. Anytime you see light existing on its own without life, that light will ultimately lead to darkness. That's why he said, now the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. That means that now the man has gotten light without life, and that makes him very dangerous. In Genesis 3, 2, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat forever. God didn't even finish the statement. There was so much urgency, he stopped talking and acted. Drove them out of the garden. You know, because now, Adam had, had gotten light without life, and that made him a very dangerous person. Do you know something? This scripture, this chapter and verse, 322, is a very important number in the occult world. In false religions, in religions that talk about light, 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 like Ekanka, without life, 322 is a strong point. If I, when you look at the skull and bones, you will see 322 written under it. I don't know whether you can go and research. Go and research. The, that's where it comes from. That man can be like God, without God. And that's what the devil is pushing, the agenda is pushing through false religions. That there's a Godhood state that you must attain. But you don't need a life of God. You don't need Christ. But you can be God. New Age theology, New Age teaching, the New Age movement, that's what they are teaching. That there's a God inside of you who must come out. But that God has no bearing, no recourse to life. But Jesus Christ is the source of life. He is the only accredited source of God's life. You know, and so 322 is a formula of the devil. God's formula was life to produce light. But then this, this uh, uh, cosmos, the formula is light, just light. Like I said, the devil had light before he fell. He was the only, only um, angel who was anointed. And he stood in that office of the Christ. And the, the component of that office that he occupied was light. He didn't have life. You see how dangerous it is to have knowledge without spiritual regeneration. To, to develop your mind at the expense of your spirit is a very dangerous and fruitless venture. And that mind development must, must be based on spirit regeneration. Because the Bible says, now that you are born again, then present your body. Then say, renew your mind. Now that you are born again. So the new birth must come before the renewal of the mind. People can acquire knowledge and dispense knowledge, but they are not born again. They don't have a connection to life, and so the knowledge that they dispense cannot give life. It's very dangerous to be receiving light, knowledge, illumination, from people who have not given their hearts to, 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 to God, who are not born again. It's very dangerous. Yeah, as I go on, you will see why it is dangerous. Now, so you realize that when the light came, when God said, let the light, the light came, the light did not drive away the darkness. Did you notice that? Go back to that scripture. Genesis 1, verse 3 to 5. When God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Okay? And then what else? And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the light did not drive away the darkness. The two were made to coexist. 
Are you, are you following? Or do you see light driving away darkness in this scripture? No. The true way, in fact, God turned the darkness into night and turned the light into day. So the spiritual identity of the night is darkness. And the spiritual identity of the day is light. That's why the Bible says things like, weeping may endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. So what we say is that those who sin, they sin at night. Those who sleep, sleep at night. Say, let us, not, let us wake up from sleep. Because night, the spiritual identity of night. Oh, I mean, I, I preach a message on the spirituality of night. Like, no, the power of night and the spirituality of sleep. I think you should listen to that message. Because I, all these things, I said it in that message. Yes, to the extent that what God actually did was that he created the boundary between light and darkness. The, the two coexisted. So when Adam came on the scene, the two were there. You know, uh, so Hebrew, uh, Job 26 verse 10 talks about that boundary. The boundary of light and darkness. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the earth at the boundary of light and darkness. So there's a boundary of light and darkness, which means that the two coexist. The two are dwelling together. Yes. Now, when Adam sinned, what happened was that he imbibed the nature of the devil, so darkness entered man. Instead of life giving birth to light, death was in man. And the devil's plan was to get man who was dead to set the standard, to set the pattern, to set the trend. Okay? That was the devil's, the, the, the devil's mind. That man will die. Die means get separated from life. And then he will use his mind now, the knowledge he has now, the light he has now, to set the trend, set the standard. So that everybody who decides to follow him will be pushing to uh, perpetuate the influence of darkness, not light. Because God wanted Adam to perpetuate the, I mean, light or his life. He wanted Adam to extend his influence. But the devil made sure Adam was disconnected so that as man will set the standard, that standard will be set in darkness. So anything fallen mankind produces as to the darkness that is in the world. That's why you cannot say somebody doesn't know Christ, but the person has released a song, and that song is what you are using to live your life. It is darkness. That song came from a heart that is darkened. The heart doesn't have life. It doesn't matter how wise the song looks like. Doesn't matter the words, it will not produce life. And for you as a believer, it will not only affect you, it will corrupt you. It will fight against you. Yeah. If, if we have to be careful because man, after the fall, go to Romans 121. You will see that man's heart was captured by darkness. Okay? Man's heart was, so was captured by darkness. Then it says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. You see, this one says that their foolish hearts were darkened. Their foolish hearts were darkened. So what will come out of a foolish heart which is darkened? It will be foolishness. The Bible says, for, from within, out of the heart of man proceeds Fornication, adultery, uncleanness, foolishness. Foolishness. I will talk about foolish talking. Foolish talking. Jesting. Foolish talking. They all come from a heart of foolishness. Darkened. So there are some hearts that are darkened. Whatever they produce is dark. So if you follow that standard, you will be going into darkness, even as a believer. That's how we should not copy the world. There is nothing the world will produce that can give us light. Or life. It says, I say, therefore, 
and testify in the law that it should no longer work as the rest of the Gentiles work in the futility of their mind. Mm -hmm. Who being past feeling, okay, having their hearts darkened, being alienated from the life of God. You see the connection now. They are alienated, separated from the life of God. So their hearts are darkened. He said, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Ignorance means darkness. Because of the blindness of their hearts. So you see that if you are following somebody who is not, who doesn't know the Lord, and he is your role model, you are, into dark, you are going into darkness. You are corrupting your soul as a believer. If somebody who doesn't have the life of God is the person who detects your movements, the person who influences your decisions and your choices, you are going to live your life outside of God and you are going to be plunged into darkness as a believer. You are going to corrupt your soul as a believer. It is very dangerous. That's why I, I call it the trend-setting system. They attempt to set the trend for us to follow we were not meant to follow the world. The head and the tail, which one follows the other? When we say, I am the head, what does it mean? It means that I am the one who leads. Others follow. I shall be the head means that I will set the standard. I will set the trend. So the world will not set the trend for us to follow. We shouldn't go to the world to learn how to live life. That, no. They should come to us to learn how to live life because they don't have life. They can have light but the light the light is not coming from life so it is <laughs> it is unreasonable for a believer to look to an unbeliever for counsel is a blessed is a one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly now if you look at the scripture he's talking about talking about the counsel talking about the ungodly the counsel of the ungodly, even if it is good counsel. You see, if you walk in it, you are not blessed. Let me repeat. The counsel of the ungodly, even if it sounds good, if you walk in it, you are not blessed. It's a blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So the ungodly also has counsel. They have advice, ideas that they propound. But if you are influenced by those ideas as a believer, it will eventually land you in darkness. Because they have light that does not emanate from life. They don't have life. That light is coming from a foolish heart which is darkened. So, why should you, as a believer, why should a believer take a song that an unbeliever has sung and then sing it? Are you getting me now? I mean, you know where the person got the inspiration from? The person sang this song then you take it and then you sing it. Why should you dance to a song that is from an unbeliever? You don't know what inspired that song. These things are dangerous. Sometimes we lose many blessings because of these things. I would think they are trivial issues. They are not trivial. The, 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 the cosmos is so smart because the thing that we don't respect, they respect. You see, the enemy believes in the power of seed, for instance. You see, an enemy came and sowed tears and went his way. He didn't even stand there to see whether the seed would germinate. He went his way. Why? He believes in the power of seed. You, the believer, you, you don't believe in the power of seed. Because you are working with somebody who is not even correct. And we are telling you the person will corrupt you. You say, no, he can't corrupt you. But that who believes in the power of seed, anytime, anytime a person is speaking into your life, is releasing seeds, he said, be, 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 no, do not be deceived. Evil communication will corrupt good character. So the person who has been speaking into your life all the time, all the time, and the person is sowing wrong seed, you, you think that you can never be corrupted. The Bible says, don't be deceived. Believe in the power of seed. So the cosmos, they believe, in, that's why they set the trend. Because the only way they can get us to follow and worship their God is to get us to follow their formula, their standards, their trend, their examples. So if you're a believer and your role models are weed smokers, 
and people who don't have any regard for God. Those are your room models. When I enter your room, I will see their pictures. You say, me, I love reggae. That you, you put the picture of somebody who, who has no regard for your, your faith. Your heart is going to be corrupted eventually. Gradually. A time will come you will see that you will struggle to believe the things that you even believed. And you wonder why. I was talking to somebody and the person was telling me how he drifted from the Christian faith. He said he used to be on fire for God and uh, he used to go out and evangelize and talk to even drug addicts and all that. Then he started listening to uh, somebody on Facebook, Common Sense Family. He said he listened to them, listened to them, listened to them. And at first, he was following them because they were lashing pastors who were abusing church members and stealing God's money. And he was happy. And he kept listening. But you see, the person can be lashing pastors who are sinning. What right has he got? He doesn't serve your God. He doesn't even respect your God. And he's lashing out pastors who have sinned and you are happy. Before he realized... He was not reading his Bible again because the person pointed certain things in the Bible to him and that made it look like the Bible had loopholes. He stopped paying tithe. At a point, he stopped going to church with the excuse that I want to be spiritual, not religious. <laughs> and so he would, he, he would stay at home. He wouldn't go to church. Till so one day, the Lord began to work on his heart. Then he started coming back. Thank God he came back. But that's the journey of somebody who drifted because he was listening to the counsel of the ungodly. Be careful of people who speak into your life. Check out, at, is the knowledge, the light they are giving me, is it coming from life or is it coming from death? That's, that's one way to settle all questions. Should I sing this song? Should I listen to that song? What about this? Ask yourself, is a spirit begets spirit? Flesh begets flesh. John 3 says, That which is spirit, give birth to spirit. That which is flesh, give birth to flesh. flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You can't, there's no two ways about that. If the thing was born out of the spirit, it is spirit. Are you telling me that you have exhausted all the wisdom in the Bible? That you are saying, oh, but this song, it gives good advice. Who sang it? Is a person committed to the Lord Jesus? I mean, you will know. You will know. I was talking to somebody, and the person is a believer, and then he said that he has done a collaboration with unbelievers and all that. And I said, what is your brand? What do you keep as your brand? Do they know you as a believer or an unbeliever? That's what I'm interested in. What do you keep as your identity? What is that distinctive mark on you? I mentioned some, some artists. Say, this one, you know, is a secular musician. Okay. Now, when they mention your name, what comes to mind? I say, some people can be singing songs that are not necessarily worship, but they, are, they, 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 they have life. And I cited Minister OJ. That Minister OJ, I know him from CCC. He's, he's a prophet. He's, he's a truly, I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a minister of God. He sang a song like, Obi Nyawaye. That song is neither praise nor worship. Are you getting me? It's giving advice. It's exhortation. But he has life. Somebody can sing a song that you say is harmless. If the person doesn't profess our faith and he doesn't submit to our Lord, we should not take that. It's the counsel of the ungodly. It doesn't matter how harmless or how seemingly, how seemingly wise the words are. I hope you get the balance. Spirit will beget spirit. Flesh will beget flesh. Let that sink into your heart. That's it to it. So, if you are doing choreography, for instance, and you go and pick a worldly song to come and dance, you are out of order. doesn't matter whether that song contains all the, the nice, nice moves and all that. You are simply out of order. You are, you are bowing to the trend of the cosmos. We, we must not follow anything that is worldly. Never. Somebody say, okay, uh, I'm having a party and I'm, I'm playing this song which was sung by, this, oh, it's a love song. Love song. What kind of love? 
He said, well, can't I play love song when I'm with my wife? What kind of love are you, what kind of environment do you want to create? Ask the person who sang the song. Is it, is it true love song? Is it coming from life? Yes. I mean, Song of Solomon, for instance, talks about intimacy, romance, and all that. Okay? It's in the Bible. Now, if you say Song of Solomon is talking about that, there's a phrase in that book which says, My sister, my bride. The woman that he was describing in all those terms was his wife. So anybody can just play a song, and that song is talking about lustful things, and so it's a song of love. It's not love. And Song of Solomon, for instance, that book, if you go into the details, it is Song of Songs, not Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon was written to describe the love affair he had with the Shulamite woman, who was his wife, one of his wives. But the Song of Songs is written, is the spiritual uh, writings behind that book that, that, that depicts the kind of love Christ has with the church. It's so beautiful. So that book is, is if, I like, if, I, if you like, one of the most spiritual books in the Bible. All books are spiritual, but this one presents the relationship between Christ and the church in such intimate terms. And someone says, oh, we have that in the Bible, so we, I can also come up with any song that will promote lust. So if we bring out a song that promotes lust, I see believers are dancing to it. We are worshiping foreign gods without knowing. Gods that Apostle Paul and Peter and God did not know. We are worshiping them in the church. See, that's why these days many bad things happen in the church. Including our culture, Christian culture, we are gradually losing it in the church. I'm telling you the truth. In the upper room, there were 20 people, right? After Peter preached, it became 3,120, right? But the 3,000 who were unbelievers could not change the culture of the 120. The 3,000 rather bowed to the culture of the 120. That is how the church should be. We, we should be so strong, so adamant in the kingdom culture that when people come in, they will have to bow to our culture. We don't have to bow to any culture, the culture of the world. They must bow to our culture. Because when you come into the kingdom, there's a, there's a culture for the kingdom. That's why the discipleship. Discipleship is teaching you the culture of the kingdom. There's a way we talk. There's a way we go about things. There's a way we marry, a way we do business, a way we do leadership, a way we do family, a way we do things. And so we teach you how things are done in the kingdom. And when your mind has been changed by the culture, that's why you say you are a mature Christian. A mature Christian is not somebody who has spent 10 years in the church. It's somebody who has imbibed kingdom culture so that his culture is the culture of the kingdom. We start thinking like God. We start behaving like God. We start reasoning with God. The word of God is what has shaped our mentality, our mindset, our convictions, and therefore our attitudes, our actions, our relationships, they are all sponsored by revelation of the word. That is Christian maturity. That is kingdom culture. And that is what we, we are about when we come to church. But you know, now, the church is gradually becoming worldly, and the world is becoming churchy. If you go to the world now, the society is largely Christianized. You will see Christian jargons displayed all around carelessly. It, it means the world is becoming, is becoming churchy. Not born again, but churchy. Religious. But the church is becoming more worldly. You will see some culture that is outside, that, was, that used to be outside the church. Now you see it coming into the church. And then you ask yourself, who are our role models? Where did we learn these things from? Or in the name of having a crossover appeal, in the name of attracting the world, we become like the world. You can't win the world by becoming like the world. Listen, you can't defeat Goliath by putting on Goliath's armor. Saul gave David a coat of mail, and Goliath too was having a coat of mail. And David said, I cannot walk in this. You want me to go and defeat Goliath, but you're giving me Goliath's armor. That's what we are doing in the church today. We want to take the world. We have to become like the world. No. No. We have to become salt. Salt, salt is, will be needed. Then we have to become light. We don't have to compromise to win anybody. Now, unless we dress like them, we can't win them. Who told you? 
unless we dress like them, we behave like them, we can't win them. It's not true. It's not true. That's not our culture. The 3,000 did not neutralize the culture of the 120. They had to bow to the culture. Yes. So the cosmos has this discipleship arm that is trying to regulate human existence. And they start establishing patterns. You know patterns. Romans 12 verse 2. Patterns. Patterns are templates, scripts. <laughs> you know scripts. Those who, who act movies, they are giving scripts. The script will, will, will tell you how to behave. So sometimes I watch actors and it's like they are very skillful because in one movie, this person will be acting like a devil and you, you will hate the person. In another movie, the person is acting like a saint and you will love the person. Why? Because they are just acting out scripts. It's not their real, but the script. So the Bible says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed to the reign of your mind. Go, give it to me in... Um, King James or NIV? I think NIV. Oh, yes. Do not be conformed to this world. When it says to this world, it means don't be conformed to the pattern. Yes, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The pattern, the scripts, the templates they give us. We should not be conformed to that. But we should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how you can know the will of God for your life. The good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God. He said that you'll be able to test and approve what is God's will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you don't renew your mind and you don't decide that you will not go after the pattern of the world, you will never find out God's best for your life as a believer. That's why we have to be separated from the world. We have to refuse their templates. We must so much be in scripture that anything that does not align with scripture will reject it. Any template. Any template. So the world gives us templates. It is very dangerous to live your life based on principles passed on to you from people who don't have the life of God in them. Doesn't matter how wise sounding they are. Don't live your life on that. There's enough godly counsel in the Bible that can shape your life, that can give you wisdom. Enough in the Bible. So all these wisdom principles from people who don't have life in them, they, they will not guide you anywhere. I'm telling you, rather spend your time reading the Bible and seeking to allow the wisdom in the Bible to inform your understanding. You will see how wise you become. You see how you beat the systems of this world. James 3, verse 14 to 19. Look at the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world. The wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Now, wait here. The wisdom that it says that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't come from above is earthly, number one. Earthly is natural common sense. It's harmless. That same earthly wisdom can be sensual and can be demonic. Why? Because it's not coming from above. There's no life in it. No life in it. So we need to know how to handle such kind of wisdom. Not to build your life the foundation of your life on that so-called counsel. People take counsel from social media as believers and that is what you are using to build your life. Using to build your, your mind concerning marriage, concerning relationship, concerning business, concerning life. Borrowed from social media. Somebody set a camera on, on him and the person is spewing something out. And the person is sharing maybe his struggles or whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you take it and then that's how you are living your life. No. When it happens like that, you are bowing to the trend of the cosmos. You are taking counsel from the ungodly. 
and you will not be blessed. He said, blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Doesn't matter what counsel they give. Once it is ungodly, once the, listen, it's not the counsel that is ungodly. It's the person giving the counsel you're talking about. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of somebody who is ungodly. Whether the counsel is wisdom or not, it will not help you. Because people can give advice. So, especially people that we look up to. I once saw somebody who gathered young people together and the person said he was doing something youth youth and he's a politician. Then started teaching them many things about life. Then he got to a point he said, and also don't waste your time going to church. All these things about hero by hero by hero by It's nonsense. Speaking in tongues, nonsense. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you an example. So, this person, let's say, you are, he's your role model. And you take everything he says without judging. So now, he has come, he's trying to educate the youth and counsel them. There are some people there who may not, who may be new, new believers, who may be swayed by that, what he said. After all, it's not important to be praying in tongues. How, why should I go to church and spend time doing kaba, kaba, kaba? It's not important. Think, think, do something, think. Use your brain, use your brain. As if those of us who pray in tongues, we don't use our brain. <laughs> As if praying in tongues means don't use your brain. I mean, I mean, see, so, and one day he met another journalist who is bored about his faith. And the journalist said, I, I heard you speaking against tongues. He said, yes, it's nonsense. He said, no, it's not nonsense. He said, I spoke in tongues with her before coming to sit here. And that journalist, too, has influence. And I, I loved him for that. Because with the influence that he had, he was able to defend his faith. That I believe in tongues is good. He even gave a scientific um, uh, research to back his claim. That I've been proving something like that, that speaking in tongues releases some, some enzymes into the brain. That calms down the brain. That, yes, scientific uh, research. Yeah. So when you speak in tongues, when you speak in tongues, these enzymes, they are released into your brain. That's why the best way to beat confusion, speak in tongues. The best way to beat anxiety, speak in tongues. The best way to beat bitterness, speak in tongues. Keep speaking. Because even science has proven that it releases enzymes. What are you talking about? Because you are rich, and we all want to be rich, so we have come to learn your formula. Then, instead of telling us your formula, you are attacking our faith, trying to tell us not to, not to do the thing that, that we know will help us. And there are many believers who are young believers who will take that. That is, that is why I have a problem when, as a church, for instance, we invite those people to come and mentor our youth. What are they going to tell them? Can't you get people who have, so, I mean, who have the things that we want, who use godly means to attain them, or let me say, who attain them with God in their heart to come and teach us how to do it? They will bring people because they have made it in life, so-called. But their values are not kingdom values. Their philosophies are different. They come and stand there. And because they have made it and you want to make it, they will tell you how to make it. They will tell you, look, if you want to make it, stop all this prayer, prayer nonsense. Think. Common sense. Work. Are you getting me? Work. And unfortunately now, you will get people in the pulpit also spewing that kind of thing. In the name of trying to help the, the youth to be balanced. So from one extreme to the other. So they will tell you, the money that you, you use for offering, save it. Uh, one pastor said, the money you will come to sow here, go and use it to buy a land. Gather it every Sunday, offering. When it's enough to buy a land, go and buy a land. And people are clapping. Ah, this is a, this, this a, a man of God. This is a man of God. Why? Because he's telling you not to give money to the church, but use the money to go and buy land. And is that scriptural? Does God forbid us from buying land? No. Should that stop us from giving offering? No. Can't you buy land and give offering? 
<laughs> so the, the, the cosmos is smart. But because sometimes we are not smart, we are not able to decipher. And I've seen people share that video. And I've seen even people who are always talking like this in the church share that video. And that, that man, I think, was a, a priest or something in Nigeria. I, think, I don't know whether Catholic or Anglican, but he was in Kasok. I was preaching like that. <laughs> you see, the cosmos, they have a discipleship arm which bends the minds of people in such direction. And they use several people, several institutions to set a trend. They peddle lies, half truths, exaggerations, embellishments. That's what they peddle. Half truth. Half truth is also a lie. So they will either give you outright lies or half truth. Half truth. People sometimes blame our backwardness in Africa to people praying. And they will say things like, how will the economy develop when people are always in church praying? And yet, that is not why the economy is not developing. God, how many per- what percentage of people, what percentage of, of people of the economy are praying in church from Monday to Friday? What percentage? How many of those people are employed? From Monday to Friday praying, how many are employed? Some of them are there because they are looking for jobs, praying to God for, for God to give them jobs. When you are saying, and hey, people are praying in churches, that's why the economy is not growing. Master, if you can <laughs> if you can't fix, if you can't fix it, don't, don't put the blame on the church. We have not done anything. <laughs> we have not done anything. What what we are see, if the church was not even in the society, do you know the darkness? People would just die like that. Because some of them go to this primitive to release the pressure on their minds. And the tension. But then you are saying that that's what is killing the economy. No, do what you have to do. Africa here is not Christianity or religion that is killing the economy. It is, it is m- many things. Many things. They, don't, they will not tell the Many things, but it's not, it's not religion. Do we use Bible in the, in, in, the, in the parliament house? Do we use Bible? So what are you talking about? Why are you saying because of Christianity that there is, we are not moving on? We are not using Bible in, in a, a Bible is not a constitution. Why don't you apply what we are using? Do we go to Bible school to be appointed as ministers? Do they appoint uh, uh, pastors as ministers? Are pastors the one handling a uh, means of education, means of this? So why are you saying the church is the one that is responsible? You have to do what you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so the cosmos is prepared to invest a lot of money in pushing these lies. It will surprise you how the world treasures information, how they package lies and they sponsor lies and they pump money into lies. They pump money into vanity. Things that are going to reduce our humanity, deplete our our potential, destroy our, our dignity. They put a lot of money into those things. And it's not new. Go to Matthew 28, verse 12 to 13. Look at what the cosmos does for what it believes. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. What were they doing? They were pushing a lie with a lot of money. The lie was that, you see, Jesus Christ had resurrected. And they, they knew they were going to lose their job, job because why were you, you were supposed to guard the truth. How did this man escape? And they said, they called the soldiers and said, come, let's give you money. This was the chief priest and at the chief priests and the elders gave the soldiers large sums of money to promote the lie that the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus while the soldiers were asleep. 
Look at how they are willing to give money to promote a lie. And when you are giving money to promote the truth, you are crying. They gave lots of money. The cosmos, they put in money into these things. Money, things that will, especially things that will corrupt the minds of the youth. They put in a lot of money. They don't spare. Put in money. Do you know how many people are willing to spend on beauty pageants? Eh? People are willing to spend millions. Support it. Entertainment. Sometimes entertainment that, that will increase immorality in the system. Yes. That will promote uh, uh, a certain kind of wrong behavior, even among the youth. Don't think that those things just come. They sit down and determine how they set the trend. If you know how fashion, the, the, the trend of fashion is set, you, when you see things on the media, before long you will see in society certain kind of dressing, appearance. You see? Now, in our culture, society now, you will see men trying to do something to their hair. It's popular now. Popular, very popular now. And we don't know where that thing came from. I went to one university recently. All the males, most of them I met, they had earrings here and there. Two. And they will have either, um, what, what do you call that one? Dreadlocks or something like that. And I said, this is, is, it, is it fashion? Is it just fashion? Is, is it culture? Is culture dynamic? Can culture change? Yes. Culture can be influenced. Okay? Traditions. Is it a tradition? What is sponsoring that thing? Why is there a craze for that? That every young man wants to do something to the hair. Do you know the one who started that, what, what, what prompted that, that you are copying? <laughs> and me, by my own personal research and experience, anytime you see people are getting mad, the very first sign you will see it in their hair. Mark it. When your hair is unkempt, you are on the way to madness. <laughs> Yes. Yes. When your hair is on camera. Okay, so, why, why, so now, even now, fine. Well, if you come to church with that, I'm not going to say you. Get out. No. I'm not going to say that. But you see, we should, we should not get to a point where we cannot ascertain the status of people who meet to us even in church. There was one singer in Hillsong who used to wear earrings. Very talented guy. If I mention the song that he composed, then later the guy came out and said that he was gay. Yes. Many people want to dress in a funny way. What are they following? Why is it that every secular artist must do something to attract attention? They must either dye their hair, do something. So what you are want to do, what is, what is inspiring them? Sometimes I'm amazed at this guy, Sakodie. Despite all the songs that he's singing, he's very decent in his appearance. Now, it doesn't mean go a little to his song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just commending his appearance because it is unusual of secular musicians. But he, his appearance, whenever you see him nicely trimmed, Beard, no piercing, no uh, hair, very decent. I, I want to know who his wife is. Because I believe that maybe that's why he's that decent. Because you can't be singing secular songs and not be dressing in a way that appeals to the gods you are worshipping. Do you know why God said, don't let a man wear that pertains to a woman. It was a, a cross-dressing was a form of worship to the gods of the Ammonites. 
when the gods manifest. That's what they do. You know, when evil spirits manifest, like fetish spirits and all that, they have things they like. I was listening to an interview granted by a young girl of 18 years old who completed Sewanya Akon. But now it's a fetish priestess. And then she said, and they were showing it on social media. They were showing how she displays when the spirit comes. She smokes in chain. When the spirit comes up on her, she smokes. She can drink barrels of alcohol. She will not get drunk. And she smokes. So they asked her, do you smoke? She said, no, no, I don't smoke. I've never smoked in my life. But when he comes, he likes smoking. So when he comes upon me, then I smoke. So when somebody is displaying what the spirit that has come upon him is detecting, then you're also copying blindly, not knowing that the person is rendering worship to his spirit. So there are some spirits that when they come upon you, there's a certain kind of dressing that you must dress. Do you know, fetish priests, I have ministered to one person who said that when the spirit comes, he must wear blue. Their sound spirits, when they come, they prescribe what they want. That what, what I want is for you to be doing this. People, people commit lifestyles. People are into lifestyles that they have no idea what is sponsoring those lifestyles. The spirits manifest and they take to them. So you go and bring somebody on stage, and the person they brought the person to Kenya University. When the person came to Ghana here, the person was smoking weed on stage. You know the person? Smoking weed on stage. Not a Ghanaian. No. They imported him. <laughs> he was smoking weed on stage. What, so he is coming to teach our youth that it's fashion, it's fun to be smoking. Why do they display smoking and drinking as part of a lifestyle of the rich and affluent in movies? You see somebody who is a rich person, pick up the, the, the smoke or uh, alcohol. What are, they trying to, what are they trying to put in the minds of people? If social media is raising our children, then we are in trouble. If we allow social media to raise them, to give them their concepts and their precepts and their opinions, then we are in trouble. The next 10, 20 years, then we must run away. We must, we must prepare to run away. Because the kind of people who are going to be leading us, both in the nation, both in the family, in the nation, and in the church, we cannot stand them. Because their philosophy was given to them by social media. And these trendsetters, they have shaped their minds. If you don't make any conscious effort to also shape their minds with the word of God, and to challenge their beliefs, they are going to have belief systems that you will not find answers for. So what I'm talking about is very serious. When you go to, I teach children, I teach children. When I talk to the children, recently I was teaching them about ear gates, eye gates. And I was asking them the kind of movies they, they watch. And how it's shaping their minds. You, it will, you will marvel. The how they understand love. Do you know, for some people, the first time they hear about sex will be on the media. And what, what kind of teaching would they teach them about sex? Would they tell them that sex is for marriage? No. They would tell them sex is for lovers. That once you love somebody, you have sex with a person. Or they would at best tell them sex is for those above 18. So they can read a movie, 18. And you would think once it's 18, if you're above 18, you can watch. No. You know the demons that have been allocated to those kind of movies. Even against you, the, the, the mature person, the adult. So, the cosmos is trying to sell their trend, their belief systems, their value systems, their philosophy, their culture, their fashion to us. And they do that through their course instructors. And these course instructors, like the media, you see, the media is one major course instructor. That's why God asked Adam, who told you you were naked? Did I tell you? Are you now receiving information from somebody else? 
Who told you you were naked? Meanwhile, nobody told Adam. It was the darkness in him. He felt, he knew he was naked. Because the, the seed that he ate, the, 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 the fruit that he ate was darkness. Darkness entered him. He had the consciousness that he was naked. But God said, who told you? Which means that somebody else has come between me and you. Feeding you with lies. So you will notice that the reason, if the church, we don't define our culture and we don't become, we, don't, we are not final about, final about our culture and then we leave our culture to chance, the cosmos will seek to influence our culture so that we will start bowing to them. That's why now we, even, even the very things we used to believe the cosmos has succeeded in rubbishing it or diluting it or make, trivializing it. Making it look trivial, unimportant, a waste of time. So, if we, if we listen to their course instructors, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. That's why the electronic media and social media they are the most potent propagators, potent of the lies of the cosmos. They, they propagate the lies of the cosmos. Why? Because they are course instructors, supposed to teach us what life is. People can come and sit on radio and they can be talking about life. You know the Bible. That's why we have to spend, we have to allow the Bible to shape our thinking. Because they will, they will show you how, how to go about your life. Whenever you see things that are popular, popular ideas, popular ideas, now people start movements, feminist movements, masculine movements, <laughs> feminist movements, and there's nothing wrong with empowering women. But you see, if you are smart, you must know where it's coming from. Why do you need empowerment? Why do you need empowerment? When God has already given you a position of influence. And you, you, you see people talking about that. And you see all those People, most of them, either they have left their husbands or they, have ne they, they say they will never marry, never submit to a man, never get involved with a man. And they are going to girls' schools, teaching them confidence. What kind of confidence? How to be assertive. Assertive to the extent that you say you don't need a man in your life. That has produced many lesbians. There are people who are lesbians. Oh, I met one of my students that I taught in Sunday school. And she was part of a movie set, a, a team, working with a popular actress in Ghana here. So when I met her, we were talking. I said, where are you now? She said, I'm here. I said, this place is very slippery. Be careful. He said, you don't know. This boss, this woman is a lesbian. And all of us, including me, we have become victims. And that's, that's, so she's recruiting young, young girls and initiating them to lesbianism. In the name of, you become part of my team. I'm grooming you for success because I've attained fame, popularity. So when, when, when we just want to be famous or follow famous people, then we are in trouble. Because we open our mouth and swallow what they give us, hook, line, and sinker. When we don't judge what they are saying by the word of God. And we don't know our boundaries. When to say no. When to say I can't go beyond this, this level. When I went to first year, I joined a group called Pan-African Students You Know. Because I love Africa and all that. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of my role models in leadership. So, we joined a group, and then we went for a lecture, one, one of our meetings, Then this Indian philosopher came 
teaching us things about uh, philosophy, whatever. And I was just watching them. They lambasted white people and lambasted what, what, what. I was just watching them. Then one day, they said, we are Africans. We will not bow to a white man's religion. Red flag. What is a white man's religion? Then they said, Christianity was not our religion. Next week, we are going to our place of worship. We are going to the shrine. That was my last meeting there. <laughs> that was my last meeting there. Because you can't change my mind. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Jesus was not a white man. He was a Jew. Even that, we are not following a religion. Jesus is now a spirit. No, no man after the flesh. If we knew Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. If we knew him, I said, now we don't know him anymore. It's not a white man's religion. Yeah, we are following what God started in the Garden of Eden. Yes, come up. Uh, where are you, Adam? Let me give you some lies the cosmos is preaching through the translators. They are preaching lies about God. About God. They always try to portray God as a killjoy who derives pleasure from our pain. Yes. And so many young people, children, growing up, listening to all these things, don't want to have anything to do with God. Because God has been portrayed as somebody who hates our getting happy. There's a killjoy. He hates pleasure. They don't know that true pleasure comes from God. There's a river called the river of pleasures. Not pleasure, pleasures. There's so much joy in God. So much joy. You see, if you really get hooked onto the joy of the Lord, you don't need any external thing to make you joyful. Those who drink, who take cocaine and hard drugs and all that, it's because they are looking for a joy, but they are looking for that joy in the wrong place. Somebody said you can't get higher than the most high. How high can you get than the most high? When the most high is in you, there's a joy you get by, by connecting with God that you can never get from alcohol, you can never get from drugs, you can never get from sex, you can never get from anything. So, when the devil came to Eve, he said, you shall be as God. Now, that means that you will not have any standard. You will be a standard to yourself. So, at the end of the day, there will be no benchmarks, there will be no standards, there will be no absolutes. Truth then becomes relative. So, it means that you have your truth, I have my truth. What may be true to you may not be true to me. Let's live in peace. That is how it starts. So we remove benchmarks. If God is not there, then we are living our lives on our own. No accountability at the end of our lives, so we can live anyhow. I watched um, uh, one short clip, illustration. The teacher asked the class, one plus one, then somebody said two, then somebody said wrong. Okay? Then the, the person said, ah, one plus one is two. Then she said, no, you are wrong. To me, it's three. And the teacher just said, they just said, yes, she's right. Your one plus one may be two. His is three. <laughs> <laughs> so the matter became hot. Because the guy was challenging. And so the other person said, why are you pushing your opinions on me? Why do you want me to accept that one plus one is two? To me, it's three. So he went to the principal. principal said that the, 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 he called the, the teacher. The another, teacher. another teacher came and said, no, it's two. So they called the other teacher, and they said she was spreading hate, hate language, discrimination, offensive language, because she's infringing on somebody's right to say one plus one is three. Then the teacher said, this is a mathematical, I, I, I mean, this is a fact. One plus one can never be three. That teacher was suspended. 
And the principal called her and said, you know something? We wouldn't allow you to impose your opinions on our students. That's how the world is now. So I have my truth. I feel I should marry a man as a man. Keep your feelings to yourself. Keep your opinions to yourself. There's no benchmark. That's the end of the gospel that the cosmos is preaching. So that if there's no God, there's no absolute in this life. There's no benchmark. If it feels good, do it. You are not accountable to anybody. Nobody's going to judge you. That's how the devil has succeeded in lying. And he perpetuates these lies through his preachers. Not preachers are saying, pastors who. His trendsetters. I'm going to give the list to you. He also portrays God as an energy, not a person that you can have a relationship with. So they will say, they will, they will say the creator, the universe. God has created this natural world and has left us to live our lives on earth without his direct involvement. So people don't want to commit to a personal relationship with God. They want to live their lives with common sense. That God gave us brains and that's all. That's all. And uh, Japan, how many hours do they pray? Uh, China. Listen. Listen. People sometimes say things they don't understand. Do you know what, do you know what, what is influencing them? Do you know, do you know the many gods they worship? You think they are not without religion? They don't pray. They don't worship anything. He said, uh, uh, go to, what about Israel? What about Iran? What about those nations? He said, in Ghana, we are always praying, 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 everything, prayer, prayer, prayer. Do we pray in parliament? <laughs> well, when did you hear that parliament the whole day was just praying? Go and sit out there and make policies for us. Don't come and blame us for praying in the church. Lies about the Bible. They also propagate lies about the Bible. The devil has always sought to discredit the word of God. But you see, history cannot deny the impact of the knowledge of God on civilization. I read a book many years ago called Under the Influence. And the book traced the influence of Christianity on all spheres of life. Architecture, Agriculture, botany, zoology, medicine, education, military, economics. It traced the impact of Christianity. Do you know that most inventors were born again? People who invented the things we're enjoying now, that they, they invented, they came out with the templates that we have, we, we have built on now. They were born again people. There, was, there were no major inventions before Christ came. Why? He was a true light. That gives light to every man. Any, all those who made major inventions, they had the life of God in them. The Faradays, Edison's, Graham Bell's, uh, Einstein was a Jew. Many of them, great thinkers, Pascal, great thinkers, they were believers. They came out with all these things. They became templates. Now, we have built on their templates, and we are saying there's no God. America's founding fathers were Christians. Look at, look at America. In God we trust. Their founding fathers were believers, not just churchgoers. Washington and Co., they were Christians. They started building the nation upon sound Christian principles. In God we trust. A generation came, they didn't have to do anything because the thing had already, had already been set. Now they are trying to remove God from the in God we trust. Sad. So you say, Americans do worship God. They are prospering. Their fathers paid the price by putting God first. In the beginning was God. When they landed on the moon, they knelt down and recited the first six verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. Why? They knew that it was God who created the world. Their founding fathers were God, were Christians. You can't deny the impact the Bible has made the work ethic, the industrial revolution of the West, it was, it was presented by believers. Believers. Check history. I've read, I said, I have a book under the influence. It traces all that. 
I read it in 2001. Traces all that. But now, the cosmos will seek to um, denigrate the Bible and reduce its value and make fun of it and trivialize it and call the Bible all sorts of names. So the Bible is with mistakes. What, 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 what? Listen, this same Bible has made a huge impact. And despite all that, the Bible remains the, the number one bestseller. Even till today. That should tell you something. There's no book that has sold more copies than the Bible. No book alive has been interpreted to many languages like the Bible. Till today. It has been criticized, banned, bent, ostracized, and yet it remains strong. Because it was written by men, but by 40 writers, but one author. 40 writers, one author. And the Bible has changed lives. The words of the Bible has changed civilizations, economies, families, nations. And the cosmos is trying to let us know that the Bible is empty. And you will get some people who call themselves men of God. Who want to please the world and think they are enlightened. Add to that nonsense that the Bible is empty. Anybody who sees a man of God who finds problems with the Bible, stop listening to that person. Then why are you a man of God? What are you preaching from? Should we listen to your common sense more than the Bible? When were you born? <laughs> this book, the oldest book, the oldest but most current book, it is still speaking to issues, contemporary issues. Ancient wisdom that is speaking to contemporary issues. What do you have? Uh, what happened in Israel, Palestinian war, and all that? You see prophecy. When Syria became Iran in 1944, you know, Iran was Syria. You see, you see Syria in the Bible. There are even some nations that are still here. They are fulfilling prophecy. Lies about the devil. The trendsetters, they lie about the devil. The devil works best undercover. He loves to work incognito. So that when he's not recognized, that's where he works best. So he, he convinces people that he doesn't exist. So when you go to some of the so-called uh, uh, civilized countries, they don't believe that the devil exists. And so he's doing a lot of damage. He's a, well, even in the church, some churches believe that there are no demons. So instead of casting out demons, they cancel demons. This thing is demonic. Cast it out. He said, no, no, there's no demon. <laughs> there's no demon. We just can through counseling. We will just cancel. Cancel. And the devil is happy. We start to give ni nice, nice names to certain demonic things. Set sicknesses that are demonic, caused by demons. They will give them nice names. Then we are pampering them. The devil loves to work undercover. So, he always preaches a lie to the world that I'm not in existence. It's not me. So, he can kill people and say, oh, that's a natural disaster. That's, that's nothing. And sometimes they say, oh, you are being too spiritual. You are being too spiritual. Listen, <laughs> listen, open your eyes and live in this world. This world is more spiritual than physical, I'm telling you. Two tests of your being is spiritual. What are you talking about? Two tests of your being is spiritual. So I, I know somebody who was tapped like this by another person. For seven months, the person could not stand. He could not stand. It just a touch. A touch. <laughs> just one touch. And you are saying this is science. You can use medicine to explain. 
how a touch can make somebody crippled for seven months. You don't, you don't open your eyes and live life as a physical. This life is more spiritual than physical. That's why you must believe in spiritual things. Believe in prayer. Believe in declarations. Believe in communion. Believe in all the spiritual things. Yes, believe in the natural things. But don't be fooled by that. Believe in spiritual things. Even doctors who are spiritual will tell you there are certain cases they will, they will pray. Hey, my sister was telling me one case that she had. She said this, she knew that this thing my medical knowledge will not do. So she put the child in her hand and she was praying. So you come and tell me, ah, it's not everything that is prayer. Not everything is prayer. I will pray first. After I've prayed, then I will do the natural. But I will pray first. Don't underestimate things so. Because there are many people who think they are wise. See, believers, one would try to be solica, we are at a disadvantage. We have to be spiritual first. Deploy your spiritual tools and weapons all the time. Engage your spiritual sight. What are you seeing? What is God saying? The, the next lie lies about the afterlife. They are lying to people that there's no life after death. When you die, you are dead. They say, oh, let us live and drink, for tomorrow we will die. We call it hedonistic philosophy. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, the hedonists, they believe that. Let us eat and drink, because when you die, you are dead. He said, if in the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we will die. If there is no resurrection, no judgment after death, then let's abuse ourselves. Let's eat and drink. For when you die, you are dead. And the enemy, the cosmos is also selling that lie. And there are people who are running away from God who, who take solace in that lie? They take comfort in that lie. So why do you worry yourself going to church? Why should I do all these things? Why? All this trouble? Why? I mean, let me just live my life, enjoy my life. When I die, then I go. Somebody said, well, what I, do, what, what, what I think will help me is that I will take care of people, I'll help people. That's my, that's my, my Christianity, my spirituality. No need for being a Christian or going to church. I'll just do good. When I die, whatever, then I die. Yeah, many people who have stopped going to church because they have partly bought into this lie of the cosmos. The next lie huh, is materialism. Materialism. This is one of the most effective lies the trendsetters, they set, they, 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 they preach to us. Is a worship of the creature more than the creator. It reduces all of life's pursuits to acquisition, hoarding of things, material things. That the reason why we live on this earth is to acquire material things. Materialism is what makes us rich people by material things. We determine people's worth by what is on them, what is in their bank accounts. We determine your worth. So we can say this one is worth much more than this one. Meanwhile, the same price was placed on our souls. But because you have ABC, you don't have, you are rated higher and worth much, worth much more than this one. That's what the cosmos has sold to us. It's all right, it's in the world, but when it comes to the church, it becomes dangerous. When we start rating our importance by the things we have as believers, by the material things, we have reduced, we have reduced the standard. We have made cheap the blood of Jesus. That the blood that was used to buy the believer, we are, we are rubbishing it and we are assigning something else as the believer's worth. Don't get me wrong, in this life, there is great and small. 
whether they like it or not, they will all be great and small, but not in the sight of God. Not in the church. When we try to bring these talents into the church, that's why we are losing many things. Materialism places things before people in order of importance. You know, we have to love people and use things. But materialism, we use people and love things. So if I can use you to get something for myself, I will use you. And you two are trying to use me to get what you want. That's what has come into the world now. It promotes a lie that a man's life consists of the abundance of things he possesses. Jesus Christ said it's not true. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses because all the things you have around you, they can never protect you. There are people who, if, let's say, life could be bought with money. Hey. There are people who will never die in this, in this life. That, let's say when you are about to die, then you pay money. Then somebody who is, who doesn't money is, is, is sacrificed for you. So that there are people who will stay alive forever because they have money to pay. But a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. When, when, when one uh, monarch died, my, my question was, this person has never seen hardship all his life. Because she was born into the royal family. They have food, everything, wealth, riches. I'm not saying they have never seen sorrow, but hardship. Like a, com a common day neither. <laughs> he will never have to pray about what to eat the rest of her life. Access to the best medical. Do you know what Michael Jackson had done to keep him alive? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson had um, a doctor, I mean doctors. Then he had people who were on standby ready to donate every organ in case he fails. Kidney, people are there, he has paid them, that when I need a kidney, you donate. He did many things that will ensure that he will not die. He will live for long. There was a time when his doctor had to put him on prescription just so that he could sleep. The amount of money that he used to, to, to pay the doctor who induced him to sleep, that amount of money, it can take care of you. So you see how priceless sleep is. You can sleep hard. Ah, <laughs> then you are just, yeah. <laughs> so that you change here. <laughs> that one, somebody has to pay hundreds of thousands to get it. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he put. So don't lie to yourself. You, you, Solomon, Solomon had soldiers who guard, were guarding him even on his bed. When you reach some Solomon, he's there. And yet death came. Materialism places seeking of things above seeking the kingdom. And um, it's, it's all the, the work of the trendsetters. Vanity is one thing they preach. Vanity. They plunge us into a never-ending cycle of chasing the wind. Fashion is like that. There's nothing new under the sun. You see a rehash of old and long-gone fashion. You see it coming again. It's a cycle. Anything that is invoked now, it will fade. It will hide. 20, 30 years' time, it will resurface in another way. Don't think you are the first to practice a fashion. No. It has been there before. It, it, it's like chapter, chapter um, 1, verse 9. Solomon said, he said that um, there's nothing new under the sun. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. Solomon was somebody who set himself to study life without God. In fact, he practiced life without God. 
and look at his conclusion. Come to chapter 2, verse 4 to 11. Solomon's conclusion. I made my ways great. I built myself houses, and I planted myself vineyard. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants, and had servants born in my house. Yet, I had greater possession of heads and flocks than all who were, bef who were before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, and the special treasures of kings and of provinces. I acquired male and female singers, listen, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. Look at Solomon, pursuing life without God. So I became great and excelled more than all were before me. Also, my wisdom remained with me, which means he was conducting an experiment. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked at all the work that my hands had done, and all the labor in which I had told, and indeed, all was vanity, and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Solomon said, sometimes as humans, we'll rise up early, sit up late, we'll be chasing things till we die. Another person will come, inherit what we have labored for, and squander all. He said, that person may be a wise person or a foolish person. You don't even know. You will labor and labor and labor. See, life is said that. If you don't create space for God, you will be chasing after the wind. Your life will be like a dog chasing its tail. You, you will think you are looking for money. You will never get it. Because no matter how much you get, you will have to get more. And you acquire property, acquire this. Oh, I listened to a woman who was, who was uh, in uh, one of the nations. And then she said that she went to the place when she was quite young. She has toiled, labored, labored. She has built a house, houses in Ghana. And yet she's still up there, slaving, living in a small room. His mansion in Ghana, somebody, the Keteka, and the family, they are living in it. And when she comes to Ghana, she can't, because the mansion said that all the bedrooms are outside, are upstairs. And she's weak, she can't climb. So she, her bed is in the living room. And people are living. So all the tall. So now she can't come and live in Ghana. What, what, is, what is in this life? If not Christ. If not Christ, now if you think that, oh, money will make you happy, you are lying. The only time money will make you happy is when money is deployed into something that is larger than yourself. That's why you see rich people, they, they don't keep money to themselves. They always give to charity, doing this, doing that, doing that. Because the thing is that you, the, more you, the more you hoard, the more miserable you become. You become miserable. You become miserable because how much food can you eat? How many rooms can you sleep in? If you can't sleep on the whole bed, you can't sleep on the whole bed. What at all is pleasure in this life? Pleasure is in finding God, living for him. When God gives you money, God blesses you for you to keep, take care of yourself. But that will not lead to fulfillment necessarily. Unless your money is deployed into, into uses that will outlive you. Like kingdom use. Like charity. We, that, the one who founded SOS. Now he's dead. He was a rich man. And he used his money to found an orphanage. And many people have gone through, they have produced many people. He's a German. We have SOS in Ghana here. Their school, people pay huge, <laughs> their school fees is very high. And all the children are on scholarship. And that man, his descendants, will be blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. But the cosmos, 
will promote a lie that you have to chase all these things for yourself and ignore God. Rockefeller was a believer. At the point, he was tithing 90% of his income to the gospel. Rockefeller. And living on 10%. When he was about to die, we still have the foundation there. Colgate was a believer. Arthur Guinness was a believer. The one who, who founded Guinness was a believer. Many things have changed. But the original founder was a believer. And he, he used his business as a platform to sponsor the gospel. A lot of money went from him into the gospel. At that time, people were addicted to liquor, hard liquor. He was destroying them. And he came out with Guinness. He brewed it. And God gave him the idea. It didn't contain what it contains now. But it, was, it came to save a situation. <laughs> Somebody is thinking. <laughs> uh, it's not what you are thinking. You know? <laughs> okay, let me end with this. The course instructors of the cosmos. One of the lies is secular humanism. Okay, but I'll get to that next week. The course instructors, the media. The media is one of them. Fashion lovers, fashion designers is one of them. They set the trend. Any fashion you want to be a trend, they will sit down. They, we call them trendsetters. They set the trend. Be careful of fashion you follow without understanding. I saw one lady wearing a ring on one of her fingers. And I said, do you know what this means? I said, when you wear a ring on this finger, you were a lesbian. If I, I taught my children that, then they said, hey, so-and-so has a ring on that finger. <laughs> and I said, oh, maybe she doesn't know. She's just doing fashion. When you wear a ring on your thumb as a man, you know what it means? It means you are a gay. Maybe you don't know, but you saw somebody, oh, it's nice. Do you know, fashion can be a symbol of status, pride, honor, uh, worth, you know, I mean, what, 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 what you do. In the Bible, people wore all kinds of things to depict who they were. So when you see something, before you copy it, pause. Don't be carried away by the craze. Everybody's doing this, let me do this. No. Especially now that the young men, the hair that they are doing, don't be carried away by that. Yeah, so that even those who their hair is going, they'll go and blow it, they'll go and apply cream and blow it and then get hair that they'll come in. I mean, that, those things, they, they, they are dangerous. You become wordly without knowing. Why should you chase the latest fat? It's a sign of insecurity and immaturity when you are fixated on the latest, latest fats. But I'm not saying that to say that the fashion is, is nothing. But what, what is it? It's this designer, so what? So what? I don't know about you. I don't respect those things. I don't know about you. So what? Oh, this designer, designer, and so what? The watch that's the designer watch and your watch. They both tell the time. <laughs> is that also? But when you wear this first, oh, he's wearing designer. That's the only profit you get. That your bag, designer bag, is the only profit. The only profit that people will talk about it. That's all. Celebrities will come and flung their designer bags. And people will be crazy. Wow, look at so and so's bag. 120,000. This, this, that. So, as a believer, that should not be your focus. Bishop Wade Pooh went somewhere and a pastor friend took him shopping and said, Bishop, surprise for you. He said, what is it? This watch that he mentioned the, the, the price. He said, God forbid. This can build two churches. I will never wear two churches on my, on my wrist. <laughs> he, said, he said, God forbid. 
And look at that man with a lot of money. If we were to be some young people, they will buy the watch and come with social media. As they are preaching, they will say, somebody say, praise God. <laughs> and flaunting it. That, that, that is how the, the, the course instructors, they shape us. Let us not fall for fashion. Your, the dress you are wearing, it should be happy you are wearing it. You should not be happy you are wearing the dress. That you are happy you are wearing this dress. No. The dress should be happy that you are wearing it. When I pick my clothes, I say, ah, you are the lucky one today. You are the lucky one today. I'm going to wear you today. Be happy. Smile, smile, smile. I'm going to wear you. So, you see, the thing is not like, what you wear doesn't make you important. You make what you wear important. Somebody can sell something to you. And because the person is wearing it, let's say when you see Zuckerberg wearing something, and they say, I'm selling it. He can sell it for thousands of dollars. People will buy it. Maybe he picked it at first line. That's how we think. Number three, celebrities. Celebrities, footballers, entertainers, they are influence brokers who shape the worldview of the younger generation. They shape their worldview. Your role models, the footballers, and all that. It is good to have people you admire. No, nothing wrong with that. But but you admire them only as far as they don't touch your Christian principles. Once they touch my principles, I stop admiring them. Yes. Because you can't come and rubbish what I believe, what has sustained me, because I like you, because you have skills. No, we must, we must, we must regulate our admiration. Some of them openly rubbish our Christian people. Some of them too are believers who are not shy of portraying that they are believers. One footballer like that, I've forgotten his name. He was Kaka. Kaka, yes. And he displayed that he was a believer, he was a Christian. And when I see people like that, I like them. There are some people, they will, they will even hide their Christian principle because they want to appeal to the world. Why can't you also influence people? I'll talk about that next week. Why can't you also influence people? Why can't you make them bow to what you believe? Entertainers and musicians. Musicians are the worst corporates. They preach more than all the other course instructors, musicians. When they release a song, listen to the lyrics, they shape minds. They influence behavior. So one song will come. You see, it's swaying everybody. You see, my children's school, they had an election. Then one guy stood for SP. And he won hands down. Because he didn't want to go for Paul. And there was a popular song that had come. <laughs> go go for Paul. So everybody voted for the guy because of that song. Not the guy, we don't know whether he can do the work or not, but that song, that's musicians, they have influence. Whether you like it or not. So if God has given you an anointing to sing, you better use your singing to promote godly influence. Otherwise, God, you, God will ask for the blood of some people on your hands. Some young person that you led into smoking through your, your music. You led into a loose living because of your music. There are people because of what ah, Bishop was telling me that when he was doing both, he picked one guy. And the guy was going to meet some people for some operation. And he was playing gospel. The guy said, Driver, can you don't you have another song? Because of what he was going to do, he wanted a song that would inspire him. The bishop said, No, I don't I don't play such song. Then he got down. Because his agenda, he needed a song to motivate him you don't know what songs do to our souls okay you know the last group people who are successful yes some of them can lead a whole generation astray that's why you have to be careful if you are organizing a Christian program for instance and then you are inviting secular people to come you must, you, must define, you must define many things. I mean, 
if you don't get people in the church who have what you want to be passed on to the younger generation and you have to import then you have to be very straight because the thing is that people who are successful they carry influence yeah? so when I bring maybe somebody who is successful in his chosen field and I bring him to come and share his experience he will come and rubbish the things we believe as believers despite his success so you will say ah but this person doesn't serve God like I, like I'm killing myself serving God look at how he has made it don't judge <laughs> don't judge that way you don't know how people make it we don't know let's be on our feet next week I'll continue with what we must do as believers why God said we are salt and light But even before then, we must make up our minds in our little corner. Can we influence people to, to do good? Can we influence people intentionally? Intentionally. Intentionally. Influence people to take the right course of action. Intentionally. At your workplace. People who look up to you. People who respect you. People who, who value your opinion. You must be intentional about shipping them to bend to the way of the kingdom. To bend to the way of God. Not by throwing your light in their eyes. But by shining your light on their path. I want us to pray that the Lord will grant us wisdom to be able to use whatever influence he gives us to the, to the, to the benefit of the kingdom. Let's pray that prayer. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Grant us the wisdom to use every ounce of influence you give us. Oh, yes. To influence people positively. Positive peer pressure. To apply positive pressure on people. To seek to change people as the salt of the earth to fill the earth with the knowledge of God and as the light of the world to fill the world with the knowledge of the glory of God help us with that influence that wisdom wisdom to desire moments where we can take advantage and project the image of God through the things we do and the things we refuse to do to be able to protect our God protect the kingdom we come from not to be afraid not to be shy of our heritage not to be shy of life people are not shy of death and they are displaying death and the cosmos is applauding them we can display life they will not applaud us but we will display life because it will save some people somebody is looking up to you somebody is admiring you use that as an opportunity lead a person to Christ give people something they can never recover never recover from never forget Thing that will help them eternally secure their eternal destinies. Let us all have both opportunities. Father, grant us wisdom. Oh, yes, wisdom. It's not enough to be different. It's not enough to be different. We must exert influence. We must exert influence. Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom he became a judge among the people and yet he didn't make a difference he was different but didn't make any difference didn't affect anybody that should not be our story the Ethiopian Enoch became born again his terror rider, rider was not affected that should not be our portion we must pervade our sphere with godly influence Anybody who comes into your, your sphere, that person must stand the risk of being infected with godly virtues and values. The risk of being infected with kingdom values. Our opinions, we should not allow people to change what we think. To change our mind about God, about the Bible. Don't bow to criticism. Don't bow to ridicule. Stand out. Defend your faith. Be proud of your faith. Be proud of what God has done. 
Let people know you're not ashamed of the gospel. No, not, no matter how high you reach in the cosmos, take the gospel along. Be an influencer. Be a person of influence. Influencing people, shaping their minds with godly principles. And we can only do that when the life of God in our hearts we allow it to take over our mind. And so we are praying. Let your life in my heart gain the ascendancy over my mind in the name of Jesus. Shalom Baha. Leko Baha. Redede Bala. Dosinta Laha. Mandi Prada Katara. Our life, the life of God in our hearts should flow into our minds. Should overshadow our minds. Our conscience. Ah, should shape our convictions. Should shape our conscience. To shape our temp- the template, the vista we see things through, the life of God in our hearts, the word of God shall be have. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are praying this prayer for Ghana. We are saying, Oh God. Let mercy drop on this nation. Let your hand be on this nation for good. Cause Ghana to prosper. Cause Ghana to flourish. Deliver Ghana from the hand of wicked people. People who don't have Ghana at heart. Deliver Ghana from their hands. People who are bent on plunging Ghana into chaos and darkness. And taking us back to political instability. We pray with God. Expose them. Flash them out. Let the earth swallow them in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Shalom akapa. Redede komba halia. Intaparala kustetede. Anybody who is thinking of destabilizing the peace of this nation. Anybody who is thinking of taking Ghana back into military regime. Let those people, let the earth swallow them. In the name of Jesus. Any group of people who are hatching such plans, expose them. Anybody who is planning to shed blood. This election here, let their own blood be shed. Whoever will draw the sword, let the sword enter their own hearts. In the name of Jesus, anybody who will use rituals to ascend the throne, let their own life be taken. In the name of Jesus, Shalamaha, AK Pradada, Mande Predes, Goliadara, Inkapaha, Le Krobarabahasa, Mande Predade, Kipalada. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Father, we thank you. We give you praise for this afternoon. We pray that, Lord, you empower us to become witnesses. Not just different people, but people who are witnesses of the kingdom. Who are influence brokers for the kingdom. Empower us to be salt of the earth and light of the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.